Welcome, everybody. Welcome. So excited to see you here at our very first webinar in a really exciting series all about digital transformation in higher ed. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. It's really, really wonderful to see so many perspectives from all around the world, universities, uh, ed tech companies, all kinds of amazing perspectives. Um, also want to share a very special welcome to our Hall and IQ clients and members of our global higher ed network. And of course, welcome to our amazing powerhouse speech speakers today. Um, I'm so excited. Oh, I should say who I am first, right? Um, <laughs> I'm Bethany. I'm responsible for customer experience here at Hall and IQ. Um, and I'm super excited to be joined by the absolutely wonderful Lacey, Lucy Blakemore, who's leading the higher ed digital capability program here at Hall and IQ. Hey, Lucy. Hello, good morning. <laughs> And our co-CEO, Maria Spies, who's also hugely engaged in this project. Just super excited to hear from both of you. Hey, Maria. Hi. Hi, Beth. Hi, everyone. Awesome. OK, so we're going to talk about a lot of really amazing things. But before we jump in, there are over 600 people registered for this webinar, which is really, really tremendous. Um, before we jump in, we'd really love to hear from you. To start things off, we'd like to hear um, if you could just head to the poll button that's in the right side of over here in your webinar browser. Oh, we've got people already starting to fill it in. Amazing. So <laughs> I'll go ahead and ask it. Uh, how important is digital transformation to your institution? One, mission critical. Two, very important. Three, somewhat important. Or four, not at all important. And we'll give you a few seconds to fill that in. Seeing lots of responses come in. I'm seeing a lot of mission critical, which is really interesting. Very important as well, hearing that quite a lot. Seeing these numbers come in, I feel like I'm in who wants to be a millionaire or something. This is very exciting. <laughs> okay, I'll give you maybe five more seconds, final answers. Okay, here we go. Oh, one last. All right, we had about 50, it looks like 58%, 59% say, saying mission critical, 35% saying very important, um, and about 7% underneath that. So clearly a resounding answer there. And it really obviously fits very well with the theme of the session that very, very important to folks on the line, which is great to see. Okay, cool. So to set the scene a little bit, I'll first share a little bit about what this series is. Uh, this is the first session of what's going to be a very, very deep look at all kinds of factors, all kinds of considerations in digital transformation for higher ed. So we've got five more sessions. If you haven't signed up for them already, please do. We really look forward to seeing you there. But those are going to be looking at all kinds of really important vantage points on this really important topic. Um, each of these is designed to be 45 minutes. So very comprehensive, but also really efficient and focused. Um, and we're really excited to hear your feedback as those continue to evolve. After we do these first six, we're going to be focusing on more tactical examples. So um, technologies, innovations, platforms, and really how they're designed and how they're driving impact. And then we're going to hear from university leaders to hear specifically what kinds of questions they're asking, what kind of strategies they're building, and really get a sense of the different parameters they're, that they're keeping in mind. Um, next, probably quite a lot of you on the line know about us, you know, our clients, our members of the network, which is really great. If you're less familiar with Holland IQ, really, really great to see you here. Um, we are the world's leading market intelligence for education, and we're really proud that we power the decisions that matter. Um, it's all built, all of the amazing work that we're driving from our clients, be them major tech companies, investors, NGOs, government bodies, um, universities, any folks in academia, all of it really driven by an, a really powerful engine, uh, a platform, and it is really used for strategy and growth. And it's just great to see the outcomes that that, um, that, that drives. Today, we're going to be talking a lot about digital transformation. First, Maria is going to set the scene, like really important context about what we mean when we say digital transformation and how people are thinking about it. Then we're going to hear from Lucy. She's going to give us a deep dive into the open source framework, how it was developed, and how it's used in practice. Then we're going to hear from Maria about key insights from our network. 
And then we're going to close with some really exciting steps for ways that you can be engaged in this process and continue to shape this critical work. Um, before I hand it over to Maria, some very quick housekeeping. Uh, this recording, like every webinar led by Hall and IQ, will be recorded. Uh, we're going to send you right after this is over. Um, we're going to send you an email with lots of important information and ways to get involved, including a recording. Um, we're also going to open up Q&A, so if you have questions as we're going, please do submit them in the chat button on the right. Um, I can't promise we'll get to every single one, but we'll try our best to answer as many as possible in discrete moments where we have pauses and breaks. So really looking forward to your questions. Okay, over to Maria. Thanks, Beth. Hi, everyone. It's great to great to see you all here. I know there's people from all around the world, so thank you for staying up late or getting up early um, if you have. Um, this section is just a few minutes to talk about digital transformation, setting a bit of a scene in the context here. Um, you are all interested in this topic. Obviously, you're here. You may be partway through your own transformation or you may be working with others who are transforming in terms of digital. And so just in terms of pulling right back out of education, this is just generally, digital uh, transformations of any sort in an organisation are hard and digital ones are, are just harder than most. Um, and yet this is the path that most organisations are on. Over, you know, almost all, like 83 to 85% of companies um, are planning to accelerate their digital transformation. This is true for universities too, but these stats are just generally organisations. Um, and 80% of transformations are intended to be at least partially self-funded out of existing digital initiatives. So there are lots of digital initiatives and people are using those and building on those for fuller, deeper transformations. Um, it's high on the agenda of CEOs uh, and, you know, most organisations will be increasing their uh, spend on digital transformation. You, you may be in this bucket as well. Just, you know, in terms of pulling down into higher education, there is absolutely increasing pressure for digital transformation within higher education. The future of work looks very different. And this makes a big implication for learning, the way people learn, what they learn, how they learn, when they learn. And so this is putting pressure on, uh, on higher education um, to uh, deliver in different ways. There are also growing options for students. Higher education is an amazing model. It's been an amazing model and delivered all sorts of benefits to the world. Now there are growing options which are becoming, you know, credible in terms of their delivery or their, their, um, their ability to, to deliver for the future. So future work looks different. There are lots of growing options. Obviously, COVID has precipitated change here in higher education. Um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute uh, in terms of our network benefits and, and the feedback from our network. Technology is now allowing for advanced interaction. Just wasn't possible be before. Many of previ the previous um, digital uses of learning and teaching were really just repositories of files and, and slides and things, but actually technology now allows for much more sophisticated human interaction and interaction with content as well, interaction with teachers, interaction with each other and so on. Cloud and mobile advances in that type of technology have accelerated access to education all around the world. This is particularly important given there's going to be two billion more learners between now and 2050. And finally, governments ask around the world are fully rethinking their policy and funding related to higher education, related to education generally, um, but higher education specifically. We are seeing governments look to other models to fund those models, whether it be vocational short courses or what has, you know, in the past been described as unaccredited. So governments are really starting to think more broadly about funding. And so all these things and, and others are increasing the pressure for digital transformation in higher education. What, what are we hearing from leaders? What are we hearing from higher education leaders? And here are some snapshots. So firstly, 83%, which is a huge number of higher education leaders expect disruption to the sector, to higher education, prior to 2025. This is a very big stat. Most people think that the model of higher education will be disrupted in some way before 2025, and that's not very long away. Digital is now the, the top growth strategy for, for one quarter of higher ed leaders. So 25% of higher education leaders are thinking, how are we going to grow as an institution? Are we going to build new products? Are we going to sell 
you know, or, or deliver to our existing customers or new customers. No, digital is the top growth strategy. That's super interesting as well. It has big implications for organisational change and transformation. However, we are also hearing from higher ed leaders that organisational barriers actually are significant. And so that, that may mean the way organisations, institutions are structured, the way decision making occurs, the way products are developed, etc. Um, one of the other things we're hearing is that old paradigms are holding back new ways of innovating. And I think this is an interesting point. So, you know, some would argue that the old paradigm of, of higher education is that small and elite equals high quality and everyone wants to have high quality. So let's try to be small and elite, but actually perhaps those old ways of thinking are, are, um, are holding back new ways of doing things. And that's what we're hearing a little bit from, from our higher ed leaders. And also not just about organisations and moving forward, but new ways of thinking about learning are also needed. We, um, you know, higher education leaders are saying we need to break out of old ways of thinking about how learning occurs. At the same time, higher education leaders understand and appreciate, recognise the complexity of the task ahead. Harking back to that first slide I showed, which is digital transformations are actually very difficult. Um, they, they rely on the whole machine, the whole organisation, the whole system to change. Um, and this is going to be no surprise to anyone, faculty readiness and faculty skills, their capabilities in digital are absolutely critical to moving forward. Without it, it's just not going to happen. Um, and finally, transformation planning are underway with institution-wide efforts. So um, what we see in the past is sort of, you know, a, a few, a few projects here and there, but nothing connected up. And now we're starting to see those in, um, institution-wide connected up efforts, which is the very beginnings of overall transformation. Just moving forward into the way we're thinking about um, digital capabilities, if you like, many of the models, uh, many of the frameworks that exist for digital transformation start with the technology. And we sort of know anyone who's been through a digital transformation or attempted digital transformation knows it's actually not really about the technology. But often those models do back solve from technology to fit higher education. And so what we started to think about is a completely different way of, of, of framework, from framing digital transformation and starting with the learner. And so our framework on um, digital transformation, digital capabilities starts with and follows the learner life cycles. Because at the end of the day, that's sort of what matters really. And then the, the technologies can fit in under there. And so that's just a, a framing of digital transformation and how we sort of got to our learner life cycle. And I'm going to hand over to Lucy, um, Beth, actually, there might be some questions. Let me hand back to you before we jump right into that uh, the digital capability framework. Excellent. Um, I think we'll, we'll get, leave a couple more seconds for any questions about that section. But uh, I just have to say, I'm so struck by that sentence, old paradigms hold back new ways of innovating. I wonder if maybe if anyone thinks about other questions, you can think of any other examples of such old paradigms. Okay, great. Um, awesome. Okay, let's let's move over to the framework. Lucy, hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so let me just share a little bit about how this has evolved before a little walk through the framework itself. Um, so it's it's been a process, of course, as most frameworks are, and it started before COVID, of course. So what you can see on the left is um, what we think of as the first iteration of this, which was back in 2018. Um, it was called informally a 16-point capability framework, um, and it was the first articulation of trying to bring together these groups of digital capabilities in a way that made sense across the whole institution. So bringing in all of these different perspectives, not just the technology, not just one particular um, function. Um, and this already was being picked up and used as, as any kind of thing that looks like it simplifies and clarifies tends to. Um, it was already being used by people in, in meetings, in change management, to put the right words to things. People who needed to explain one aspect like learning design to someone else who might not know about learning design. Um, 
So we knew already that it was, it, it had something interesting in facilitating conversation and finding the language to connect people across um, what is a very complex area. The iteration and evolution of that is what you can see on the right. Um, it's based on a heap more conversations. So there were already a lot of conversations happening with the model on the left and then going deeper talking to people about what each of these stages in the student life cycle actually means in an institutional context. So coming away from the theory and looking at how that actually works in practice started to unfold and unroll a lot of these concepts. So um, we rapidly kind of started thinking of it as either, you know, you take that blocky box and you open it out into a life cycle that resonates with almost everybody that, that we've spoken to. Everybody sees some kind of life cycle. We give it different names and so on. Um, but also it unfolds. Um, and they're the two kind of perspectives I'll take you through in a second. Um, another couple of things to note, it's, it really is grounded in practice. So each time when we challenge on what's in these, what we call the capability blocks underneath, um, we're looking at um, not necessarily is there a technology, although that often came up, is there a technology, is there something that's helping here in digital capability, but is that a thing? Is there is there a department or a role or a person or a function that's doing that in universities? Um, and so there were lots of sense checks like that to make sure it was a, a real framework and not only theoretical. Um, and you can see even just visually moving from the left to the right that we've embraced complexity with this framework. Um, it, it can feel a bit, overwhelming if you start to look too closely, but there are, there are ways to kind of look at it that, um, that bring that under control, if you like. Um, so here it is in full. You can read it in a few different ways. You can read it left to right. So looking at demand and discovery first, which has got things like marketing and recruitment and enrollment in, moving into the blue section with learning design, which has got things like curriculum and content and subject matter expertise and bringing in teaching strategies. And then moving along again to the green box um, in learner experience, that's where you kind of feel the shift into the campus. You can almost run your eye around the different departments in a university as you're looking at this. So we're in the green, you're starting to shift on campus. You can see the offices and the academic administration. You can start to picture students walking through doors and, and the various digital capabilities that support their experiences. Um, an assessment comes into this one as well. And then on the right-hand side, work and lifelong learning. Um, which kind of begins with work integrated learning, which really spills back into the previous section, um, career planning, relationships with industry and business engagement, and then alumni and continuing education. And really this isn't strictly left to right either. It loops back around again. So you think about alumni and what we learn from alumni and their experiences, um, and that loops right back into the strat strategy end of demand and discovery and thinking about, okay, what have we learned? What do we do next? How do we develop further? Um, just a, a final point, whilst we're looking at it as a whole, um, different people, different roles will engage with this in different ways. So if you have a very broad role and you can look across that whole thing and you, you know you have responsibility or oversight of all of those areas, you might not go super deep into all of those blocks underneath. You might just want to look at it from a, a broader perspective. Equally, if you specialize in learning design, you'll probably want to swim around in those blue boxes and poke them and prod them and think about what they mean for you. And you may just want to be aware of the other boxes and where they come in, but um, you'll go deep instead of broad. Um, okay, so one way quickly of navigating this, you can start from the top. You can look at those four dimensions um, and think about the capabilities in your organization. Maybe there's one or two that are absolutely way more important than the others, and you know you're only going to want to think about those. At the next level down, we've got 16 domains. Um, and if you're starting to specialize, then you'll start to interrogate those a little bit. And again, you might actually even just lift a box out and say, well, that's not relevant to us. Um, most of the time, these did seem to be relevant for most institutions, apart from the outliers. And then you go down a level and you get into the, the glorious complex detail um, of the individual capability blocks. Um, this is especially where not all of the blocks will be relevant. We, we tried to go broad and deep 
um, not so specific that we'd have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of boxes, but enough that there'd be something to represent most institutions. But there may well be institutions, for example, who um, don't do a great deal with industry partnerships or don't have B2B customized programs, for example. Um, and that's OK. You don't it's not a thing where you tick off every box um, and you have to challenge every box. It's it, you take and interpret what you need from it. The other way that um, we can think of this is going left to right. And let me just walk you through some of the um, the different domains that are in here, um, which um, when we come to the self-assessment will be explained in more detail. Um, so demand and discovery, this is um, the easiest way to think about this, why brain always defaults to the marketing and recruitment, but really it starts even before that. This starts with strategy. It's how are you monitoring the market and the customer needs and what your competitors are doing and new business models. And then what about the marketing processes? Interestingly, the, the marketing processes is often one of the loudest areas in this demand and discovery. But when you look at this as a whole, it's just a few boxes. And there's actually a whole heap of other stuff around demand and discovery that fits around it. So, you know, you can already imagine one very practical use of this is, um, you know, if, if people are obsessed with marketing automation, for example, you go, well, that's one box in this whole context. And this is one box in the whole institutional context. Um, and you can do that throughout. So demand and discovery goes through to student recruitment and enrollment management. And then we flick on to learning design. Now this already, you can see there will be overlaps between things. There are some things in this domain that you might put in learner experience or that in your institution would have something very heavily to do with another um, another of these vertical areas. Um, and that's okay. It's, you know, ideally maybe this would be a 3D moving model and you would shift boxes in different places if you really wanted to, but at some point you've got to put them in rows. Um, so learning design, this is where um, you can imagine there's a, maybe it's one person, maybe it's a huge team of people, but they're really challenging what are the design principles behind what we're doing? Um, how are we structuring programs? What are the learning environments and the delivery models that we're using? Um, accreditation already comes, you know, way before you're even hitting the campus and quality management. And then into things like digital content and courseware. Again, this is quite a noisy area, perhaps, you know, the, the video and the immersion and all the kind of the quite sometimes very flashy tools. But again, it's, it's one strip in a broader area. Um, subject matter expertise, so designing for digital learning, there's a bunch of new skills around um, the capabilities for digital learning and how you design well in those spaces, which could cover, you know, everything from accessibility to um, using visuals to all of those kind of skills. Um, and then the final vertical in learning design being teaching strategies. So even before you get in the classroom, how are, how is it all being put together? Um, how are we giving teaching staff the capability to teach in certain environments, how we're we designing assessment, experiential learning, group work, and so on. And then we get into the what I think of as the campus. Um, so the learner experience, um, the first vertical there is about academic administration. That can include anything from the professional development that is provided for faculty, how faculty are managed and supported. So how easy is it for them to come in and put their hours in the system, for example? You know, it can be as banal as that, but it impacts your staff experience, which impacts your student experience and so on. Um, then into the learning and academic experience, there's a heap of stuff in here. And my goodness, this line was very long before it got paired back to um, just what's in here. But student portals, for example, um, which are often the anchor point of any student's learning experience, synchronous, asynchronous learning, all the different ways that interactive learning and servicing um, services can be supported by digital. Um, and then just as importantly, you can see them as two sides of the same coin. You've got student life. So the learning, absolutely, but the student life and their experience. We've heard so much about well-being and student care this year, and it feels like that's getting finally the right amount of airtime. So it's it's got there's a block on well-being and mental health. There's a bunch of, you know, without going into technologies, of course there are apps and there are great support systems now for students um, who need to reach out for support. And you know, if you're a tiny campus and you can't have someone there 24 hours um, just to go deep into a block briefly. Um, and then assessment and verification, which oh my gosh, so many arguments about where to put this because it goes throughout the whole journey, but um, as a little an, an end point on 
on the learner experience. Um, and again, if, if you've paid any attention to what's been going on in the last year, this has received a whole heap of um, attention in terms of whether it's remote exams or um, different types of assessment, badging and credentialing and so on. I can hear I'm going into that accidental, overexcited, talking a lot about every block. Bear with me, nearly done. And then work and lifelong learning, um, which when we, we, we did a lot of interviews when we were developing some of these iterations, and this was the one where people often feel least confident, at least it's least developed, um, certainly on the digital side. Um, if people of, of my generation remember careers planning as dusty, dusty rooms with one person giving you poor advice and it's come along a long way, but there's a lot of digital capability um, that, that's still to be looked at there. So whether it's work integrated learning, again, that slips back into the learner experience quite often, um, workplace simulation and projects, internships and placements, even student part-time work, what are the platforms or, or options being made available to students there, career planning and placement and how well that's being done. Mm -hmm. Um, job application support and so on. There's a lot of kind of platforms in this area as well, thinking about how students and business and communities are connected. And that industry engagement for, for universities is obviously always was crucial. Now, again, getting um, a lot of attention. And then finally, alumni and continuing education, um, which is becoming much more sophisticated than just, you know, the newsletter or the magazine um, being sent out after a year after you leave. So just a couple more from me. So frameworks are great, but putting it into action um, is even better. And that's, you know, when, when we did a lot of the initial research around this, trying to link it to what do I actually do with it? How do I use this with a team? Or how do I start a conversation with this? Um, there are people who will pick up a framework and they'll design a one day workshop because they've got the talent to do that. But um, many other ways of dealing with this involve, you know, having something structured to work through. So. Um, Thinking about things like self-assessments, um, there's one that you'll get access to um, that I'll explain in just a minute, an individual self-assessment, which sits at the level of those 16 core domains. So there's a statement that explains um, what, what excellence looks like in that domain, um, and then assessing, is that actually, um, is that something you're doing well? And then what's the potential impact of that um, if you did it as well as it could be done? Um, Many people have um, talked to us as well about the institutional side of that. So how can I bring people together, whether it's five people or 50 people at my institution um, from across all of those functional areas? And how can we do this together and look at all our answers and start a conversation about how we're seeing our capabilities, where some of the misalignments might be or the gaps or where the strengths are that we didn't know about and so on. And that's where we shift into priorities and direction. Um, how looking at something in a framework like this and almost you know imagining a heat map or something being brought to your attention that you just hadn't seen before because you couldn't see it in a frame um, can then start to guide discussions about digital transformation um, and then finally you know strategy without action or tactics is, is a little useless so strategic decisions and digital choices you know is this about a buy build partner decision ultimately um, or is it about you know making sure that the people are in place or the process or the technology and so on this is where you can imagine it gets more and more diverse as you move along you know, the framework looks nice and neat but then as you tailor and you interpret um, whether it's for a small institution um, in a rural area or a huge institution that's well established um, somewhere else um, there's lots of different ways you can interpret so just finally from me um, what you'll get um, after the end of this is an email with a link to a self-assessment and this is to the individual self-assessment so you don't have to do it together with others or compare your answers with others you can just do it um, through your own lens um, anybody who's got a good view on what's happening with digital capability in a higher ed organization um, can do it. So um, whether you're in marketing, whether you're part of the learning design team, whether you're part of the academic support team um, or student experience, or whether you run the careers center, you'll have something to contribute to this. Um, it takes, if you do the whole thing, it takes about 15 minutes, but if you're just an expert deep in one of those areas, you can skip through and you might just spend a few minutes on that. Um, particular part of the assessment. Um, and this one is being run in cohorts, which will roughly report back about quarterly. Um, so then you'll see um, a whole summary of how people were answering and what the trends were, um, as well as getting an automatic um, readout of your own. So you'll be able to refer back to that and remember what you put. Um, 
And I think that is it from me. Thank you very much. Amazing, Lucy. Really, really great overview there. Um, we've got a couple of questions. I know we don't have a ton of time, but uh, one theme I saw from a couple of questions was how we think about this from the lens of research and you know, kind of traditional academic research and things that tend to be grant funded. Any thoughts on that for either of you? We, we deliberately kind of set research aside, didn't we, Maria? <laughs> <laughs> knowing that it was going to be a big area and that it it has its its kind of own place in this um i don't know maria whether you wanted to add anything yeah i think i think um you know when we when we build this framework we when you build anything that's in any sort of structure it's sort of an exercise in compromise you have to make decisions about where things go and there were already quite a number of academic frameworks not just academic frameworks but frameworks out there that looked from the the institutional, the organisational side, organisational structure, do you have the leaders in place? What about, you know, funding? What about? And so we deliberately focused our um, efforts on the student life cycle. And the research and, um, you know, grant side of things is usually sort of one step back from the student. We wanted to focus on the student experience and the teaching and learning side of it rather than the, you know, universities have, have got a multi sort of purpose. They are, you know, they've got lots of, a few, key different um, objectives. And so we're focusing on that one, which is teaching, learning, student experience. That's our focus. Um, so we thought we'd, we'd hone in on that. Um, okay. Just in the, in the chat box, I'm um, in the question box, I see quite a number of questions um, about, will you get the slides? <laughs> Just housekeeping. Yes, immediately after the session, you'll get a um, an email with the link to the recording, so you can you can jump back on this. And at the end of the presentation, there's more links that Beth will go through um, where you can get more information about everything. Perfect. Do you want to move to the next section, or are there any questions? Yep. That... Okay, there's plenty of questions. Um, we've Patrick's um, doing a great job of answering lots of them. <laughs> great job, Patrick. <laughs> And I think we can answer them as we go in some of these other sequences, but yeah, perfect. For sure. For sure. Um, okay, so let's just focus a little bit on network insights. So this is insights from our global network of higher education leaders. Um, and we ask them about um, where are their digital capability gaps right now and ranking the, their digital performance and their priorities. So a couple of interesting things here. And it's sort of links in with what I was saying earlier. So firstly, in terms of di digital capability gaps, it's really process and people that are the issues. Not issues, but they're the things that need to be focused on, they're the gaps. And so upskilling the team broadly um, in digital and thinking digital, digital skills, etc., is hugely important. And process um, lends itself to those internal structures, decision making, etc., workflow, how things are done in an organisation, that's at the heart of digital transformation. So that's where university leaders were saying our gaps are, not necessarily in the technology. Um, the technology sort of can follow and actually a lot of universities are, are, are well structured, got a great infrastructure for technology itself, but it's the other things that are where the gaps are. In terms of digital performance, um, most, you know, ranking of digital performance, demand and discovery, which is the marketing, student recruitment, CRM and so on, um, ranked most highly. So a lot of institutions think they're pretty good on digital performance in that area, followed by learning design, work and lifelong learning. And last ranking is learner experience. Now, this is probably not, you know, hugely sort of shocking. Learner experience is where it all comes together or not for digital. And so it's where the rubber hits the road. The learners and their experience is the result of your technology, the integration of data, the skills of your teachers in terms of digital and design and delivery and all that. So it all really comes together in learner experience. And that quote you can see there, no one is accountable for digital learner experience is really interesting because it's sort of everyone's responsible and no one's responsible. And so we are starting to see actually in universities the um, new roles coming up, which is uh, digital, digital learning or, you know, digital transformation even. And so departments that are, and leaders who are beginning to st take over a responsibility or at least coordinate, um, given that universities are typically a sort of devolved decision-making. Um, so, so coordination across, and that speaks to that process thing. 
Um, in terms of digital priorities, again, I mean, it's not surprising probably. Learning design and learner experience are the top digital priorities in terms of capabilities. Learning design and learner experience are pretty much core business for universities. That's what they do. They build learning experiences, the learning, they design products, they design curriculum and, and um, learning experiences and then they deliver them. And so, you know, this is getting back to core but um, focusing that core through digital. So that's what we hear from our, um, our higher education leaders. And we, we did this sort of across different sizes of institutions. Super interesting process is right up there across all institution types, small, medium, large, extra large. Um, whereas, you know, in terms of people, um, in terms of capability gaps, we see larger institutions, it's a, it's a bit sort of up and down, but larger institutions are saying, yeah, okay, we really need to do something about um, the ca digital capability in our team, essentially. Um, in terms of priority, learning design and learner experience, those two middle blocks are the, you know, the digital priority. You can see there that a quarter, approximately a quarter of institutions are saying digital um, learning design and learner experience are critical, a critical priority for us. Um, and so that's the, hence the focus. And then, you know, almost 50% saying it's a high priority, we've got to do something about this. In fact, all area is a high priority, which speaks to digital transformation, but it's interesting that those two um, are the biggest and it is, as I said, core business. Um, in terms of uh, learning, you know, digital, digital capabilities in learning design across different organisation sizes. Um, th that's just honing down in here on digital, um, le on learning design. And so smaller institutions, there's a, a third of them are saying it's critical. Probably this is because, you can't too much generalise, but probably it's because smaller institutions are typically more focused on uh, a, an intimate on-campus experience and of course through COVID they just have to pivot very quickly and so they you know sort of getting up to speed very quickly on the redesign of their products for digital um, but again across the board it's it's pretty important um, and then learner experience in terms of um, learner experience is the area of greatest need and uh, again through the sizes of institution there you can see um, that uh, you know, what type of skills they've self-assessed on um, in terms of learner experience. And it's, it is a bit, um, you know, confronting to see such a large proportion of institutions saying they have just foundational or emerging, none foundational or emerging capabilities in digital, in learner experience, because that's what the whole of 2020 has been and probably 2021 as well, hence the, the sort of huge focus on this. And then one of the options, Lucy, you alluded to it earlier, which is, okay, well, what do we do about this? What are our options here? And so the buy, build partner is, you know, essentially one of those strategic uh, sort of choice sets that institutions have. And we started to look at um, the partner side of things and wanted to understand what organisations, what their approach was to partnering with outside organisations for digital. And so we asked them about how they partner or whether they want to partner. So their approach to, you know, what we call outsourcing digital capability. So in small organisations, 50% um, of those institutions would use a, a, a partner, a strategic partner for digital just as a short-term gap fill. So we need to do it now. Let's partner with someone who can help us get up to speed very quickly. And at the same time, they're developing their own digital skills whilst partnering, but ultimately um, they're saying, 50% of them are saying, you know, this is going to be a short-term process until we upskill ourselves. Um, whereas larger institutions uh, prefer not to partner for digital. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting to see, and may, that may be because they have the resources already um, to build their own, um, but uh, it, it's interesting to see that still, you know, except for very large institutions, approximately 30%, a third of universities are um, taking a strategic partnership approach, which indicates it's a longer term way of operating um, in, in, through partnerships with external organisations for digital. 
and that's interesting and that leads me to the last slide in this in this section which is about I, I'm going to pause on this slide for a little while because I there's a lot of colors and there's a lot of numbers here so let me walk through it but these are the number of institutions as in universities who are establishing academic PPP so academic public private partnerships that means not not public private partnerships for you know canteens and security but public private partnerships for delivery of core business that's teaching and learning and academic programs and so on the left hand side we see OPM partnerships OPMs being online program managers these are private companies who work with universities partner with universities to help them go online essentially and so by size of organization just have a look at the 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 upswing firstly over the last 10 years so more and more institutions are choosing strategic partnerships um, uh, for digital that's what this is showing and um, you know we're seeing institutions of all sizes um, grow in this space except perhaps the um, uh, you know, from 2019 to 2020, very large institutions. There's been a reduction in the number of new partnerships, um, and that speaks to what we we saw in the last slide. But essentially, what it's saying is, um, all institutions are growing, thinking about academic public-private partnerships to help with digital. On the right hand side, we're seeing the number of new university boot camp partnerships over the last 10 years, of course, nothing before 2013. But just look at the growth in those partnerships, in particular with very large and very and small organisations or institutions. That is a huge increase. Now, boot camps are um, public, but private companies that offer typically tech skills, but they're broadening now. So coding and data science and, you know, data security and digital marketing and all those sorts of things. So firstly, typically it's around tech skills. And secondly, and those tech skills change rapidly. So your curriculum has to move fast. Um, and the other thing is that they are typically, you know, short, intensive learning opportunities, historically face-to-face -face intensive, but over the last 18 months, increasingly um, online boot camp type digital skills, digital upskilling. And we're seeing a lot of activity in this space where universities are choosing the partner option because it gives them a couple of things. Firstly, it gives them access to a market for rapidly changing digital skills. And, you know, curriculums in universities are slow moving, not fast moving typically. Um, and secondly, it gives them the opportunity to um, build into a whole new market, which is, um, you know, uh, work um, work at professionals who want to upskill themselves while they're working or completely pivot and change their career into into digital and so this is a growth strategy for universities as well and we're seeing a number of different models which is for example universities partnering with a boot camp for digital skills and those digital skills those short boot camp three week intensives or something are embedded inside curriculum and then given um, credits inside a curriculum or they could be um, you know part of the continuing education strategy of universities but that the partner um, option is one that is definitely one to keep an eye on and it's growing and it's, it's also related to digital and digital transformation and so um, you know we've got a lot more to say about that in upcoming webinars actually and so you might want to tune into those and on our website as well but that gives you a flavor of what's happening in the market I know there's I can see a lot of um, questions scrolling through and I haven't been able to look at any of them but hopefully Patrick is <laughs> answering some of those let me just move on and hand over thank you Beth amazing um, okay Wow, Lucy, Maria, thank you so much. Really, really amazing way to set the stage for what continues to be, I'm sure, a really, really exciting dialogue. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, it's really great to see so many people asking questions and thinking through this and just helping us as we continue to shape this. Um, some next steps. So we're going to follow up momentarily, like within seconds, I think, uh, after the session concludes concludes with a recording of the session and um, with the presentation. Um, we're going to be also sending you lots of information about how you can join the network. It's a really, really exciting 
uh, new initiative and we really hope that you'll participate. Um, by joining the network, you get all kinds of amazing benefits like updates in your inbox as we continue to make progress in this work, invitation to future events. You can participate in the work and of course, really, really excitingly fill out the self-assessment yourself. Um, next steps, please join the network, fill out the assessment. Um, by joining the network, you also can download the framework and really start digging into it in more depth. So another really great incentive there. Um, and then of course, please join us for more sessions. We really hope to see more of you here and we can't wait to continue the conversation. Um, did I miss anything, guys? <laughs> Only, only that, um, like you already said, that immediately after the recording, uh, after the webinar's finished, the recording will be emailed to you, and then in that email will be details about how to join the network and yes. the self-assessment and things like that. Amazing. Thank you so much, everybody. Lucy, Maria, thank you again, and looking forward to seeing everybody again soon. Thanks, Beth. Thanks, everyone. It's been great. Bye-bye. Thank you. See you. Bye. -bye.